morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, my darling. Good morning. That's my wife. Good morning. I don't call everybody in the audience my darling, but I could be tempted to. Good morning, my darling. Well, how nice of you to choose to be in the room with me on this day. Let's talk about abundance. Abundance is a topic in which I have had a great deal of interest through the years. And so have many people. And the first thing I came to understand about abundance was that I, when I began to look at it deeply, and when I began to receive my information from a higher authority, is that I have been misdefining what abundance really is. That I thought that abundance was stuff. You know? It had to do with how much stuff I had. And I hate to be simplistic here, and I really hate to be really obvious here with what I'm going to tell you, because I know you already know this. <clears throat> but for those of you who have forgotten that you know, I'd like to remind you of what I was reminded of in my dialogue, that true abundance has nothing to do with anything that I am having and everything to do with what I am being. Let me tell you how I wound up in this chair, just to give you a little bit of background on how all of this began. In 1992, I had reached the end of the line for me. In 1992, I had reached a point where I was losing, again, another committed relationship with a significant other. My career had reached a dead end. My health was falling apart. I mean, nothing was working in my life. And this relationship that I had with my significant other was the one that I knew would last forever. And there it was in front of my face, just disintegrating right in my hands. It wasn't the first time that such a relationship had disintegrated right in front of me. Nor was it the second. Nor was it the third. No, the fourth, and so I, <laughs> I knew that there was something I don't know here, the knowing of which would change all of this for me. I couldn't seem to find the formula. I was either doing something that I did love, but I was dead broke, or I was making enough money to skim by and, you know, making it through but my soul was dying a thousand deaths. I didn't seem to know how to put the two together, you know, not for very long. And if I did get them together, it was always for like about six or eight months. It would all fall apart. All of this was happening at the same time. Now, see, usually God had been better than that. It was usually one thing or the other <laughs> before in my life. But at this particular period, for reasons that still aren't clear to me, it was all at once at the same time. Oh, God said, let's give him a triple whammy. Let's do the old career relationship body number the same week. <laughs> and one night I threw back the covers of the bed because I had awakened in the middle of the night, filled with rage and upset over how my life was. I stormed out into the larger part of the house looking for answers in the middle of the night. I went to where I always went for answers in the middle of the night, but there was nothing decent in the refrigerator that night, so I went to the <laughs> couch instead. And there I sat on the couch, you know, four o'clock in the morning on the couch, stewing in my own juice, as it were. And then I called out to God. I thought, well, I can run around and break up the house, you know, tear apart the dishes or whatever. But I sat there and I called out. God, what does it take? 
what does it take to make this game work? Somebody tell me the rules. I promise I'll play, just give me the rules, you know. And after you give them to me, don't change them. And I asked a ton of other questions as well. And then I saw on the coffee table in front of me, there happened to be a yellow legal pad lying there. There was a pen next to it, so I picked it up, flicked on a lamp, and I began to write my anger out. You know, it seemed to be a safe, quiet way to deal with it at 4.15 in the morning. I don't know how it is with you when you are angry and when you're writing, but I write, you know, really big when I get angry, and there I was. What does it take? I was really angry <laughs> to make life work. And what have I done to deserve a life of such continuing struggle? <laughs> exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And on and on I went like that for about 20 minutes, just writing out my anger, you know, defying the universe to give me a response. And then I finally calmed myself down just a bit felt just a little bit better, and I thought, okay, that worked. I have to share this process with some friends. That works. Took the pen to put it down, and the pen would not leave my hand. I looked at that, and I thought, isn't that interesting? My hand is cramped up from all that writing. So you always find a reason. <laughs> I brought the pen back to the paper for reasons that aren't clear to me now, and a thought came to me, a little voice right over here, just over my right shoulder. And I call it now my voiceless voice. And the voiceless voice said, Neil, do you really want answers to all of these questions or are you just venting? I said, well, you know, I, I am venting, but if you have answers, I'd sure as heck like to know what they are. And with that, the answers came. In a flood. The answer to every question I ever asked came to me. And so fast that I felt I had to write them down or I would forget them. I see, I never intended to write a book. I was simply writing this stuff down because I didn't want to forget this stuff that was coming to me. So I wrote it down in a flood as fast as my hand could fly. And as I read what I was writing, it brought up naturally other questions for me because it was astonishing stuff that was coming off the pen. So I started writing the questions that the answers brought up for me, and that brought more answers, and I wrote more questions, and that brought more answers, and before I knew it, I was involved in a non-paper dialogue with what I later came to know must be God. And that's the short story of how I happened to be here. And I wound up sending that on-paper dialogue to a publisher. And it was published, and two million people have purchased it. It's been translated into 24 languages around the world. It's really astonishing to see something you've written come out in Japanese or Greek. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> and to realize that somehow or another, in fact, you've touched the entire world. So that's how I got to be sitting here in the front of the room. I'm very clear now that I was called on to be a messenger. I'm very clear now that in fact that's what I've always been is a messenger, and that there's no place I can allow myself to be except in the front of the room, because I have a very important message to share with everyone whose life I touch. And here is the important message I've come to share. All of you are a messenger, and there's no place else that you can allow yourself to be except in the front of the room. And all of you have come to share a very important message with everyone whose life you touch. And here is the important message that you have come to share. All of them, each of them, is a messenger.
And here's the message all of us have come to share with each other. Hello, wake up. Do you know who you really are? Hello, wake up. Do you understand? Here's the message we've come to share. You and I are one. There's only one of us in the room. If you think that we're separate, cut it out. <laughs> we're not separate. There's only one of us in the room. And there's no difference between us. And if you think there's a difference between us, cut it out. Because there is no difference between us. And stop trying to create an artificial difference where there is none. And when you get that you and I are one, and there's only one of us in the room, and only one of us on the planet, and only one of us in all of creation, everything that causes you pain and misery, travail and struggle, heartache and difficulty will disappear. It will simply go away. So stop thinking that you're over there and I'm over here. And get that there's no place where you end and I begin. Such a simple, elegant message that changes everything. When will we get it? When will we get it? We'll get it when we send it. If we're not careful, we're liable to forget who we really are. And we're liable to play a game called, I know and you don't. Except that I'm not willing to play that game now or ever. I'm very clear that there's nothing I have to say that you don't already know. So thanks for coming and good night. <laughs> Somebody had their hand up. When you um, described you heard the voice, and subsequently when writing, asking questions, writing the books out, getting a response, um, was there a particular feeling associated with that particular voice or that particular impulse to write that authenticated it um, over, say, other times we hear a voice, or other times we're urged to write. Was there something, um, Different was there about something it? else, a presence or a feeling yes, or yes, anything there was. that you can describe? Yes, there was. It was, um, a, it was a softness. First of all, it felt as if my whole body had just gone into jello. I don't, almost don't know how to describe that. It was just a a releasing of every bit of anxiety or tension uh, or I want to say negativity within me as I sat on that couch. I can recall just almost as if without any act of volition on my part. I didn't say I'm going to, I'm going to release my tension here. It just happened. I just suddenly... And then from that softness sprang a... Uh, it's very difficult to discuss this. It's a peace and a sense of incomprehensible joy and oneness, a joy that almost brings tears, that kind of a deep, deep joy. And from that first moment, I just sat there and the tears began to flow before I wrote more than 10 words. I can recall the experience of the ink blotting on the page. I was using one of those, you know, felt tip pens and the ink was running as my tears were flowing. And it rarely is less than that I've kind of gotten used to the experience now. So I, I'm aware of what's going to happen. But I, I know what it, what it feels like. Have any of you ever been present at the moment that a baby is being born? and held it in your hands for those first three or five minutes of its life. And have you ever had that experience? That's what it felt like. It felt that way like when I held my child for the first few moments of its life and looked in its face and there was no other feeling I could have except oneness, complete connectedness, love that knew no limitation of any kind and no condition at all. Just a sense of, oh, 
can't even put it into words. That's how it felt, like holding your newborn child in your hands. That's how it felt. And I knew in that moment that I was, in fact, holding a newborn child in my hands. I knew that I had given birth to a new me. I didn't invoke the voiceless voice at all. I, I think what happened was I simply called out to the universe, really called out to God, as many people do, in their moments of quiet and deepest desperation. You know, my God, what do you want from me? And really, my, my question was larger than that. If I'm to stay alive, how am I going to do that? Because I didn't really want to even stay here. You know, I wanted to just check out. So I, I kind of challenged God in that moment. Either give me a reason for living or I'm gone. And I just don't get this. Don't get what's happening here. When I first heard the voiceless voice, it was very much as if someone was whispering in my right ear. Um, and the feeling that came over me was one of extreme calm. I was, uh, I was, I want to say, becalmed. Very much at peace. And filled with kind of an um, indescribable joy. Um, you know, I, I think of uh, moments in my life when I've had that joy. Uh, the moment that I married Nancy. Not even the whole ceremony, but that particular moment when the minister finally said, you know, do you? And in that moment, I looked in her eyes and I just paused for a moment and said, I do. And it was just that tiny sliver of a moment when your whole body is filled with something you can't describe. That's how it felt in that moment when I first heard that voiceless voice. Just joy, a peaceful, calming joy. From the beginning of time, all we have ever wanted was to love and be loved. And from the beginning of time, all we've ever done is create moral constructions, religious taboos, societal ethics, familial traditions, philosophical constructions, all manner of rules and regulations telling us who, when, where, what, and how we may love, and who, when, where, what, and how we may not. And unfortunately, the second list is longer than the first. What are we doing? What are we doing if I walk up to the sky and I see the beauty of me, sees the beauty of you? What is wrong with that? Or if I walk up to a stranger and say, I see who you are, how is that not okay? I don't understand how we've decided to construct it here, people, but I've got to tell you this, if we don't change the construction, we will never have the truest experience of who we really are. I recall sitting in a room full of people a little bit larger than this not too many weeks ago when I was facilitating a retreat in the beautiful mountains of Colorado in Estes Park. And in that room, a person said to me, I wish I could experience abundance. And that was his issue. And he said, you know, I don't make a great deal of money. I have barely enough to get by. I had to, you know, really squeeze the pennies to get here, and so forth. And he said, I've all my life wanted to experience the kind of abundance that I see you, and he pointed to me in the front of the room, you know, experiencing. And I said, well, you know, um, if you really want to have the experience of abundance, why don't you spend our lunch hour giving abundantly of that which you have to give? And he looked at me, astonishingly enough, and he said, I have nothing to give. He really thought, I mean, he wasn't even making that up. He really thought he had nothing to give. Mm -hmm. And so I had to look at him and begin to say the obvious. Do you have any love to give? Oh, he said, and he wasn't even sure about that. 
but he, I think, had to concede the point that perhaps there was a morsel of love within him that he could give. He said, yeah, yeah, I suppose I have some love to give. I said, do you have any compassion? Does compassion reside within you at any level? Yeah, well, I yeah, suppose I have a little bit of compassion. People have called me a compassionate guy. He was having a hard time saying the word compassion in the same sentence as the word me. You know. But he allowed us to help. Perhaps he had some of that to give as well. He said, do you have any humor? He said, oh, yeah, everybody's having a great sense of humor. I got, I got enough jokes to last for a lifetime. I said, terrific. <laughs> and we made, it, we made a list of the things that he had in abundance. But, of course, he didn't think that had anything to do with abundance as he was describing it. I said, okay, let's agree that we disagree on our definitions of what is abundance, but let's agree that you do have an abundance of these things. And we could agree on that. I said, great. Now, well, here's what I want you to do. Spend your lunch hour, and I want you to give of these things that you have acknowledged that you do have in abundance. Give of them in profusion. Give more than you ever gave before to everyone whose life you touch while we're on our lunch hour. That's my challenge to you. And he agreed to, to accept the challenge. And so he went off on the lunch hour and he began to outpour that of which he had abundantly. On everyone, there were like maybe 600 people at this place. 200 of them were in our retreat and 400 from other places. So there were lots of strangers who didn't know who this guy was or what he was up to. See, so he walked into the cafeteria and it was like a major confront for him because it was like, well, my group knows that I'm going to act crazy now, but the rest of these people don't know that I'm not going to act kind of nuts. Because you see, when you give of yourself abundantly, half the world calls that crazy. See, they say you must have some, something going on with you, something's wrong. You, people don't act that way, which of course is the problem. People don't act that way. <laughs> so here he is walking up to people in the cafeteria and he is sharing abundantly of that which is abundantly his. He's sharing of his love and his good cheer and his humor. He was telling jokes all over the cafeteria. Some folks were laughing. <laughs> That's pretty funny. And other folks were laughing. <laughs> <coughs> who is this guy? But everyone couldn't help but have a little <coughs> grin. Even those who didn't think his joke was that funny. Couldn't help but grin a bit at this wonderful guy, this Santa, who just showed up in the cafeteria all of a sudden. And he was going around saying wonderful things to people and just... And one person, as it happened, was not in that good of a mood. And it was his opportunity to, to show some compassion. And he showed compassion by not telling any more of his bad jokes. But then he sat down next to that person and said, I don't know you, but I'm from this other group that's doing a retreat in the other lodge. Everything okay? Before he knew it, he had become involved in a conversation with God. And he got to express that part of himself. This guy came back from the lunch hour feeling so huge, see, feeling so big. And he said, I, I can't tell you. I said, how I feel? I said, do you feel abundant now? He said, yes, I do. I feel abundantly wealthy with all these grand parts of me that I haven't really given myself permission to express. That is to say, express, push out, to express, to push out. Hadn't, hadn't uh, given myself permission to do that. But what was really funny, and here's the trick that the group played on him. While he was at lunch, somebody went to the room and got their hat, and everybody in the room put money in the hat. <laughs> So that when he got back to the room, the guy had like a lot of money <laughs> in the hat because the room just wanted to prove to him, you know, what goes around comes around and all that. It was this, this incredible in-the-moment experience of the truth. And he just sat there, this grown guy, and the tears started to flow, and he had a direct experience of what is eternally so. That which you give to another, you give to yourself. And you can give it in one form, and it will come back in another. But it cannot fail to come back to you 
because there's only one of us in the room. And his life changed out of his new awareness of what abundance truly is. So the first thing I want to share with you about abundance is get clear what abundance is. And if and when you decide to give abundantly of the grandest part of who you are, with everyone whose life you touch, if you decide to do that, your life will change in 90 days. Maybe 90 minutes, be careful. <laughs> because people will suddenly get who you are. See, let me explain to you the difference. Here are two lawyers, and they both have an office on the same block in the same city. They both graduated from the same college, and they both graduated at the top of their class. So they have equal skill levels. It's not about location, because they're both on the same block in the same city. See? Yet one lawyer, lawyer A, is doing fabulously well, and lawyer B, just a few feet down the block, is not doing so well. What's that about? What's happening there? What causes one person to be the thing we call successful and another person not, given everything else being equal? What's happening there? Lawyer A is very clear. Plumber A is very clear. Doctor A is very clear. It's not about what he's doing. It has nothing to do with what he's doing. So be careful that you don't get caught up in a thought that your abundance, or what you might want to call your success in life, will come to you out of what you're doing. It will not. And if you haven't learned that, life will teach you that because you'll do all this stuff. So you'll be doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that and just wind up with a great big pile of doo-doo. <laughs> And you'll wonder, how did I create this pile of doo-doo here? I was, you know, I did all the right things. And then it will dawn on you, oh, I get it. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing. That that isn't the connection. That isn't how all this good stuff that I think is going to flow to me is going to flow to me. And then we see another person down the street who appears to be doing nothing. And abundance is just flowing down upon him. You know, just you can't, can't push it away fast enough. Say, well, that's not fair. How, how does he get to have all that? He's not doing anything, which is, of course, precisely the secret. He's not doing a damn thing. I mean to say, and I chose my words very carefully there, he's not doing a damned thing. And we've been spending our lives running around doing all these damned things. <laughs> but he's being something. When he walks into the room, he is being something extraordinary. He is being love, compassion, wisdom, humor, joy. And he's being one. See, the highest level of being is. He's being one. You know, when you go to a doctor, lawyer, plumber, dentist, whoever it is, anybody to whom you're going, you know, the clerk at the post office, doesn't matter. When you're going to that person, you look into their eyes and you go, whoa, they get me. They, they see me. They're, 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 in a sense, although you might not articulate it this way, they're, they're like one with me. This is a, you know, we walk away saying, what a nice person. What a nice guy. Wasn't she, wasn't she sweet? That's our way of articulating, boy, I felt an immediate connection. This person doesn't feel separate from me. There are no barriers. There are no walls. So you get to decide whether you choose to be person or whether you choose to be a person. If you choose to be a person, person A, and give abundantly of all the magic that lies within you, the magic that lies outside of you will be attracted to you and become as much a part of you as you allow it to become. Got it? So the important thing for us to remember 
when we're searching for right livelihood is to stop looking for something to do and start looking for something to be. And to get in touch with that part that resides deep inside of you that knows who you really are and see what it would take to call that forth in uh, a beingness way. So look inside. What is it that I'm being when I feel totally fulfilled and totally self-expressed? What am I being when that happens? Maybe I'm being a healer. Maybe I'm being sensual. Maybe I'm being creative. Or well, there's some level or state of beingness that would describe to you in a word or two the essence of what's showing up for you, what part of you that's really showing up big. But before I get into it, as I said a minute ago, before I get into a detailed explanation of that, I want to go to some other thoughts, first of all, that I have noticed block people from experiencing uh, abundance and that blocked me from experiencing abundance. And now I am going to talk about abundance in terms of dollars and cents. Many people hold the thought that money, per se, is bad. I don't know whether you hold that. And some people hold that thought um, almost uh, unconsciously. That is to say, if you ask them directly, do you experience that money is bad? Is it your thought that money is bad? They would say, no, it's not. Uh, money is good. Many people would say that. But they act as if it's bad. Do you ever have anybody do you a favor and when you want to offer them a few pennies just to kind of compensate for some of the hard costs that you know they've put into it, they won't, they won't take the money? What do you suppose that's about? They don't want to take your thanks? No, they're happy to take your thanks. They don't want to take your money? No, they don't want to take your money for it because somehow the exchange of money for the good thing they did for you at some level besmirches the exchange. You see, it's, it, it, it drops it to a level that starts to feel icky. You see, there's a guy I, I once knew named Reverend Ike who used to say, I love money and money loves me. That's a great message. I love money, and money loves me. And I don't declare that in my universe, God is everything except money. <laughs> but rather, I declare, God is everything, including money. See? That money is just another form of the energy of life that we call God. So we need to get off of our idea that somehow money is bad. You know, we talk about filthy lucre, you know, and, and, and we talk about being filthy rich. And, and we use those phrases that, that give away what our inner thought is, or at least the inner thought of society at large is, about, about this. And I can tell you that society still holds this thought very deeply because one of the questions I am most frequently asked how does it feel for you to be going around the country talking about spirituality and making so much money at it? As if somehow I'm doing something wrong, you see? <laughs> As if somehow that should, that should be a warning to the public. See, Big warning. See, look, look, at, look at how much money he's making off of this. And every so often I get a letter from someone who says, if you're really so spiritual, why don't you give away all of your royalties to the poor? See, why don't you, for that matter, just put the book on the internet and let people have access to it for free? See? And the reason that we don't do that is that if we did that, the publishers would go out of business and the book could never be produced to begin with. Mm -hmm. See, somebody has to do the first thing called publish the book in some form. Even putting up something up on the internet costs money. So because that's true, what we notice is that money is just the lubrication that makes the machinery of life work at this present time on our planet as society is currently constructed. And that's all right. See? So I refuse to go to that place that says if you were really a spiritual person, you'd give your book away, you wouldn't, you'd take the royalties that you do get for it and, and spread it out among the poor, and you wouldn't take any of that for yourself. As it happens, just as a matter of information, Nancy and I and the foundation we've created do. Uh, contribute a, a large sum of money each year to many, many worthwhile causes. That's not important. It's just what's true. It's just what's so. But, you know, I love making a lot of money because it allows me to do a lot of things and I'm very clear what I want to do in the world. 
I'm very clear the changes that I want to cause to happen. And as I said, in our society, it takes that lubrication to make that occur. So what we have to do is get com comfortable, is to get comfortable with money, as we have to also get comfortable, I might add, with our bodies and with each other. We have to learn to get comfortable with the stuff of life so that we can say, bring all that life is to me and all that I am a part of life I bring to you and not be ashamed of any part of it because God doesn't know from shame. Everything changes when you make a decision to be one of the courageous ones. Someone who chooses to make a life rather than a living. And that's when your whole experience shifts. You create a shift beyond belief when you change your thought about what you're up to here. When you decide, in fact, to make a life rather than a living. And that shift is so enormous that everything is altered in your experience, including your experience of money. And make no mistake about it, this is possible. I'm here to tell you that shift happens. Now we have a question over here. So a conflict I, I have with money, I also appreciate it, enjoy it, and um, I used to feel like I would have to do things I didn't want to do to get money, which now I see that's not a problem, but a conflict that's still left for me is that I feel like if, um, if I'm having a, a lot of money, if I have a lot of money, I'm participating in a program or system that leaves the majority of the world on the outs. And it would be much more acceptable for me if I knew that everyone in the world had food, everyone in the world had medical care, everyone in the world had housing and clothing, and then money was simply a means to play with more, say, quote unquote, unnecessary. I, I hear um, every word you're saying, but be careful that you don't use your righteousness about that to deprive yourself of the very empowering instrument that could cause it to happen through you. See, be very careful that you don't use righteousness to disempower yourself from being one of those who can actually cause that to happen. My life is dedicated to creating a world exactly as the one you've just described. But I can tell you that I'm far more effective in doing that now than I was when I was denying the very power that would cause me to be able to create those kinds of changes. Every moment of righteousness and every moment of judgment stops you from expressing the grandest idea because no one can hear you anyway. When you speak from righteousness or judgment, no one can hear you. Not only then do you push away the power that would cause you to be able to create it, you push away the people that could even bestow on you that power because no one gets righteousness, not even those you are trying to help. You know, one of the biggest traps of the human experience is, is righteousness. And sometimes we feel we have what I want to call a right to be righteous. I mean, we really feel that we have a real firm grasp on right and wrong in this particular situation, whatever that might be. And we might. I mean, given the relative uh, realities of what is right and wrong anyway in any given circumstance, but within the framework of that relative system of thought, we might in fact be dead right about something. It's a very dangerous place to be, though, because righteousness can block effective action more quickly than just about any other kind of attitude or experience. It stops us from being understanding, you see. When I think I'm right about something, I can't begin to understand how you could hold a point of view different from me, or how a condition can be allowed to be, uh, to, to continue. I lose my compassion for the people that created that being what it is that are out there that I'm being righteous about. When I lose my compassion, 
I lose my ability to make any kind of really effective change for the better. Because no one likes to be made wrong. It, it is, it's especially dangerous, I think, for us to become righteous about uh, all the wrong that's being done in the world. Because being terribly righteous about what's being done wrong in the world is a huge announcement that we don't understand that we've placed it there. You also said something else interesting. You said in the earlier days and times when you contemplated these issues, you would catch yourself doing something you didn't want to do or thought you had to do things you didn't want to do in order to, to quote, sell out. No one does anything they don't want to do. Let's get very clear on this. No one does anything they don't want to do ever. We just do what we want to do given the results that we anticipate it will produce then we pretend there was no other way and convince ourselves to feel bad about the choices we've made. See, no one does anything they don't want to do. No one. There is never a time in life when you do not have a choice. Ever. As a matter of fact, you have created the circumstances of your life, including this place that you call no choice, precisely to give you an experience of the choices that you have. You've actually created this apparent roadblock to cause you to notice that there was no roadblock to begin with. And some of you will notice that, and most people will not, and they will allow themselves to live the rest of their lives imagining that they had no choice. I had no choice is the most frequently used rationale for us doing what we wanted to do in the human experience. Some people feel victimized about money. They don't really get, they don't really understand that they're always at choice in their lives about anything and, and especially about money. It seems to some people that they are at the women whimsy of uh, you know, the winds of fortune, to use perhaps a well-chosen phrase, or the winds of misfortune, as the case may be, and, and uh, they see really no connection between their monetary situation in life and their consciousness, and the level of their consciousness. They don't make a connection with what's happening with them financially and how they're creating it, yet I'm telling you that we create everything. Money doesn't come to you because of what you do. If you think that money comes to you because of what you do, then of course you'll have all of those doing this alibis. I didn't uh, get my college education or I was disadvantaged to begin with or I haven't had the opportunities you've had because you're going to imagine that money flows to you because of something you're doing rather than something you're being. Beingness is something that everyone has, regardless of their education, their station in life, their ethnic or cultural background, their social status. See, everyone can be loving, everyone can be extraordinary, everyone can be generous and giving and compassionate and friendly. Everyone can be all the things that we pay people big money to be, regardless of what they're doing. See, it doesn't really matter. The lawyers that make the most money, the doctors that make the most money, the ministers that make the most money, the paper boys that make the most money, are the paper boys that show up with an enormous smile on their face, a huge open heart to everyone whose life they touch. They're the ones who go around and get huge tips from the people that they're delivering papers to, and all the other paper boys are wondering, how do you do that? Oh, see, you've got a better bike, or you have a better family background, or you have a better neighbor, or you got a better route, see? No one in life has a better route. All we have to do is share with each other a level of beingness that others recognize as something they want to be touched by all the time. And if we're willing to do that, it doesn't matter what our doingness in life is. We can be plumbers, paper boys, street cleaners, or corporate presidents. But all the good that comes from life will come to us in life when we are willing to open our heart and share from a deep level of beingness with others of the treasure that resides within us, which is called love. But what it comes down to ultimately is a willingness to just show up in this space 
as the wonderful you that you are, regardless of your story. You do that and you'll be happy in life. By the way, you'll be happy in life whether or not you have a lot of money. So we do what we want to do given the circumstances that are in front of us to either avoid or create an outcome and then we say, I have no choice. But you do have a choice. And every choice you make, every decision you make, every thought you think, every word you utter is an announcement and a declaration of who you think you are and who you choose to be. Every act is an act of self-definition. And you always have a choice. But remember this, no one ever does anything inappropriate given their model of the world. So not only are you always given a choice, you are always making a choice and you're always making the choice that you think will best produce or avoid the outcome that will cause you to assist yourself in defining who you really are. That's what you're up to. Now you may not articulate it in that way, but I assure you that's what the human soul is up to. And when you begin to see it that way, when you begin to frame it in that way, you see life in a whole different way and you imagine life to be a grand adventure because suddenly it becomes an extraordinary adventure, an adventure in self-creation. Neil, I wonder if you could tell us why so many spiritual seekers or so-called light workers seem to be up against it financially. Uh, those of us who left our corporate jobs and are sort of called to do our right livelihood and yet the, the testing ground seems to be can you make it through the, this financial fire? Uh, why is it so many of us have that going on? The moment you declare yourself to be anything, everything unlike it will come into the space. And it has to. It's the law of the universe. Why, you ask? Because that's the way the universe works. And here is why. In the absence of that which you are not, that which you are is not. Did you get that? You're shaking your head, my dear. I said, in the absence of that which you are not, that which you are is not. Now let me give you an example. Are you big and tall and fat? No. How do you know that you're not big and tall and fat? Because compared to other people, I seem to be somewhat medium. So if big and tall and fat didn't exist, you know, if, if big and tall and fat didn't exist, how would you know that you were not big and tall and fat? Supposing that everyone looked like you. God, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> no, actually, you all look great just the way you are. Just a little one-liner that I can't resist. But what is your name? Karen. Karen, supposing just for the sake of this discussion that everyone looked exactly like you, how would you know how you looked? How would you know how to describe yourself? How would you be able to say, I'm the one with the long, dark, oh, I see everyone has long, dark hair. Okay, well, I'm the, I'm the one that's relatively slim and I, I, I'm kind of short. Well, actually, everyone is short and kind of, how would you be able to even know who you were? You, you wouldn't, would you? Not in this relative existence. Not on the outside. No, not on the outside. And if everyone were identical on the inside, you wouldn't even know the inside of you because you'd all be the same. No? Therefore, I promise you that if you want to have a direct experience of who you are and of what you are, you will attract to yourself like a magnet everything that you are not. Because in the absence of that which you are not, that which you are is not. Got it? Mm -hmm. Bingo. Thank you. Mm. Now the secret, once you know this, is to not resist it. Because what you resist persists. And what you look at disappears. What you hold and embrace, you make your own. What you make your own no longer resists you. That's why masters never resist the opposite of who they are, but rather see it as the grandest blessing. Bring on the opposite. 
Bring on that which I am not, for I will not only welcome that which I am not, I will merge and become so much a part of it that it will bless that which I am and cause it to have grand expression. See, all the universe is is a field. Some people call it a morphic field. A feel, I call it a field of experience, a field of expression, life expressing life itself. It's a contrasting field, a field of contrasting elements, if you please. And it is only within this field of contrasting elements that any particular element can know and define itself as what it really is. That's true in the relative universe. Now in what I've been told is called in our language the realm of the absolute, such a contrasting field is not necessary, nor is it for that matter even possible, because the realm of the absolute is by definition absolutely what it is. Do you understand? And there is nothing else. And we call that God. In my language and in my utterances and in my form of expression, we call that God. In the beginning, there was all that is. And all that is is all there was. And there was nothing else. There was nothing else except all that is. And it was very good. But it's all there was. And there was nothing else. And yet it sought to know itself in its own experience. And so it looked outside of itself for something other than what it was that it might know itself in its own experience. But it could find nothing outside of itself other than what it was because there was nothing outside of itself and there was nothing other than what it was because it was all there is and there was nothing else. How then to know itself in its utter magnificence. And so that which we call God ceased to look outside of itself, for there was no place outside of itself to look. It therefore looked within that it might know itself. Not incidentally such a bad idea, should you choose to know yourself, to look within and not without. For those who fail to go within, go without. And so God looked within, and in the interior of that which is God, did God see all the magnificence for which it searched. And it literally imploded. That is to say, God turned herself inside out for us, and imploded, into a thousand, kajillion, kajillion different parts, going here and there, up and down, left and right, and all of a sudden, here and there, up and down, left and right, were created. Fast and slow, big and small, were suddenly created in that glorious moment, in that first thought that produced God in its kajillion elements, that each one of the elements racing from the center at a thing that was now called speed and created the illusion that we now call time. Each of the elements could look back at all the rest of God and say, Oh, my God, how wondrous thou art. And who among us has not done exactly that on a starry night or in a room full of people? Oh, my God, how wondrous thou art. My grandest vision is that, first of all, all of us come from three principles, economically, spiritually, politically, socially. We would come from three principles. The first principle is that we are all one. Do you imagine what the invocation of a principle such as that we are all one would do to us economically on this planet, and politically and spiritually. It would produce such upheaval and such shifting and such change that we almost can't describe it, and it would be all change for the good, for the better, of course. Wars would end tomorrow. Disagreements would be virtually impossible, certainly disagreements that lead to violence.
would be very difficult to sustain, given the thought that we are all one. We will construct an economic reality around that basic spiritual truth. There's only one of us, and it is possible to do that. And that economic reality would eliminate all thoughts of ownership, for instance. We wouldn't own anything anymore. And when we get to that place, we'll stop despoiling the land, destroying the environment, and uh, doing the kinds of things that we're doing to Gaia, to this planet, because we think we have a right to, because after all, it's ours. This property is mine. I get to do with it what I want. By what manner or means, by what level of reasoning, can a society of evolved beings allow themselves to justify one-tenth of the people holding nine-tenths of the resources and refusing to share them equitably by saying, you don't understand, it's mine, I bought it, I worked for it, and you can't have it. How much is enough? That's the question that is placed before the one-tenths of the world's people who are holding nine-tenths of the resources. How much is enough? And how much do other people have to suffer in order for you to feel that you've got enough? And that, by the way, is not an economic question. It's a spiritual one. And so, that which is the collective called God leaves it up to the individual elements of God to remind each other. Do you see how wondrous you are? Oh my God, how wondrous thou art. Yet when we fail to say that to each other, when we fail to bring each other that message, we fail in the grandest mission of all. For we have come here to know ourselves. We've come here to know ourselves. Yet I can only know me through you, ultimately. Because there's only one of us in the room. But should you declare yourself to be abundance personified, that which attracts all the grand abundance of the universe, including money, I assure you that one of the first things that will happen is you'll have the direct experience of having no money at all. Anybody ever had that experience? <laughs> there are three levels of creation. So we are each, each of us three-part beings made up of body, mind, and spirit, just as God is made up of body, mind, and spirit. So each of us are an individual duplication of the triad of energies which we call God. And that triad in our language I call body, mind, and spirit. And so we each have three centers of creation or three tools of creation, body, mind, and spirit. That is to say what you think produces energy in the universe that if you think it often enough and long enough will actually produce a physical result in your life. Anyone experience that? Sure, most of us have. In fact, a guy back in 1946 wrote a huge best-selling book on this called The Power of Positive Thinking. You know, that New Age writer, Norman Vincent Peale. <laughs> and um, our second level of creation is uh, our words. As you speak, see, so will it be done. And so your, your word is really a form of energy. You're actually producing energy in the room with what you say. And that energy is creative. You say something often enough, loudly enough, and I promise you it will come to pass. If two or more start saying the same thing, I assure you it will come to pass. And when a whole group of people start saying the same thing, it cannot help but come to pass. This is called group consciousness, and it's, by the way, why the world is the way it is. Because our collective consciousness has not allowed itself to be raised to the level of the individual consciousnesses of many of us. So we, our job is to raise the, what? Collective consciousness. 
Now our actions, of course, are the third level of creation, that which we do with this huge, huge collection of energy called our body. We start, and this is a very gross level of creation, very gross level. I mean, I'm, I'm moving the air right now. Just, just moving your hand through the air is a huge, huge movement of energy here. That's why you can literally, you can literally push energy towards someone. Anyone ever come up to you when you weren't feeding well and just literally stand there with their hand over your head and do nothing else? And in five minutes, you can begin feeling that, or five seconds sometimes, feeling that warmth, that vibration. And doggone it, sometimes if you don't go, I don't know what you just did there, but whoa, do I feel good. <coughs> now, of course, if you go even further than that, I'll do this here with this lady who happens to be my wife. If you go even further than that and actually touch each other, incredibly magical things can happen. I guess the energy has <laughs> even happened over there. You see that? Incredibly magical things can happen. <laughs> because the energy is very gross and very, not very big, you know, very heavy, very, very real. Now, the problem we have in life is that most often people start think one thing, say a second thing, and do a third. That is to say, they do not, as the kids would put it, have it all together. So they think one thing and they do another. Or they say one thing and they think another. Or they don't say what they're thinking. Or they don't do what they're saying. Yeah. Now, I know that none of you in this room have ever had that happen to you <laughs> in your life. But in my experience, there have been times when I have encountered that, that conflict between the three centers of my creation. So I often do not want to tell people what I'm actually thinking because I'm not real proud of what I'm thinking. Then why are you thinking it? God only knows. <laughs> or sometimes, lately I've started to monitor my thoughts, and I've started to, when I get a, a, a thought in there that I no longer choose, you know, that's not really who I am, I, I don't give it a second thought. <laughs> See? I literally don't give it a second thought. I just throw it out. And if you don't give it a second thought, it's, it, it no, no, no longer has power. Because the nice part about this energy is that it's very thin, very ethereal, and you have to keep thinking it and thinking it and thinking it and thinking it over and over again until it's thunk so much that it becomes very heavy with collective energy. I'm li literally explaining to you the physics of the universe here. Life begins to change for you when you begin to say what you're thinking and do what you're saying. And then you have it all together and you start to create from all three centers of creation, and suddenly you begin to manifest and produce extraordinary results in your life in a very short period of time. See, so, so thought, which is the most ethereal form, or when I would say the thinnest, for, for, to use a simple word, the thinnest form of this creative energy. Yeah. And then your word is the next thickest, to use a simple word, the next most dense. And then, of course, your action, I started to say, is a real dense form of moving energy around in a real gross manner. All right. So one of the fastest ways to create something in your physical reality is to reverse the normal process by which we create things. Usually we create things first by thinking about it. I think I'll go to that party. And then we say something about it, as in, Matilda, I'm coming to your party tonight. And then we do something about it, as in, showing up at the party. Here I am, just as I said I would be, because I thunk the thought this morning. Okay? That's generally how we produce things in our reality. In fact, everything in this room was once a thought in someone's mind. There is nothing that was not once a thought in someone's mind somewhere. But if you want to really play tricks with the universe and create magic with the stuff of life itself, reverse the thought, word, deed paradigm. Turn it upside down and start with the deed. That is to say, act as if. If you want to experience abundance, be abundant and do as abundance does. Therefore, if you have only $5 left to your name, go to a store and get them transferred and made into singles. And take five singles and walk down the street and give a single to each of five people who have even less than you do. And by the way, you will find those people very easily. I'm reminded of the story of a guy named Joe who actually lived uh, in San Francisco on the streets. 
And as little as he had, he made it his job every day to find someone who had less than he had. If he managed to panhandle a couple of bucks on the street, he'd give two, two and a half times that uh, to, to someone who had even less. And uh, he was a very abundant guy. He was known as the king of the streets, in fact, because he was the source of abundance for everyone else on the street. Um, people on the streets uh, can begin to experience abundance if they are willing to allow someone else whose life they are touching experience abundance. Uh, uh, in that instant moment. That might seem easier said than done. I mean, I'm sitting here in the lap of luxury making that statement. And I don't want to sound shallow. And I don't want to sound gratuitous. But I lived on the street. I lived on the street for over a year of my life. And I remember what pulled me out of it. For the first three months, I felt desperately sorry for myself. How has, <laughs> how has it come to this? With all my talent, with all my ability, with all that I had, how has it come to this? I'm on the street, for God's sake. In that moment, I decided to live. And I decided to live my life. And that was the greatest decision I ever made. And that's what I would say to anyone who feels trapped, whether in a corporate job or in any place in life. How much of your life are you willing to give away? And how much of your life are you willing to reclaim? And once you reclaim your life, how much more do you think you'll have to give to others? Not just of material things, but of the joy and happiness which now resides in your soul. You will always find in your experience someone who has less than you, no matter how little you think you have. Not because the world is such a terrible place, but because you will create it in your reality in order to give yourself the experience I'm talking about. So you'll walk down the street and you'll see this. Now, by the way, when you see this person who has less, don't feel sorry for them. Get that you put them there. <laughs> see? Otherwise, you'll see that little soul and you'll start to have pity on that soul. Do not come from pity with anyone. Come from caring. Come from love. But get clear that love is not pity. As a matter of fact, pity is about as far from love as you can get. So do not come from pity, but come from compassion. Compassion says in your mind, oh, there's a person who thinks they don't have what they could have in life. There's a person who still is caught in a belief system that creates a construction around their reality that's other than my own and other than the ultimate truth. And have that compassion, but never have pity. And so you walk down the street and you give the last of your five dollars away. Now what happens there? What's going on? You've reversed the thought word deed paradigm. You're now doing what the person who comes from abundance would do. And you begin giving away what an hour before you made that decision you couldn't imagine giving away because you thought you didn't have enough. But now you're clear that you have more than enough so much more that you choose to give it to others. Now, as you're giving this away, you're creating in your body, which is a very gross level of energy, an experience. The body is, is noticing cellularly, oh, oh my gosh, I'm giving this money away. Look at this, I'm even letting it go. <laughs> it's kind of like in church on Sunday morning. See, you know what your thought about your money is when the basket comes around in church on Sunday morning and you start pulling out those dollar bills. <laughs> I'm giving a whole dollar. Did you see this, Mildred? <laughs> Put it in the basket there. Wow, great sermon this morning. I'll make it five. <sighs> wow, big sermon, you know. See, pull out a 20. Get your checkbook out and write a 100. Let your church know how important it is to you. If you go to church or go to synagogue or go to a place of worship and it serves you, pull out your checkbook and write a check for $150. Do it just once. 
let your church, your synagogue, your place of worship know this is how important this place is to me. I spend this kind of money on all kinds of nonsense, much less sense. I spend this money on nonsense. And do that wherever you see something that makes sense to you. Give, give, give of whatever you have to that which makes sense to you, and you will discover that it makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. Dollars and cents. And money loses its value the moment you try to hang on to it. Money only has value when you're willing to let it go. Get that for those of you who are saving your money. You're not saving anything. You're losing. Do you know that even, it's true even in the world economy, the longer you save money, the less it's worth. You know that? To make up for it, we have to have some artificial construction called interest rates in order to convince you that holding on to money allows you to increase its value. You're lucky the longer you hold on to money, you're lucky if you manage to maintain its value. No, no, no. Money has its greatest value when it leaves your hand because it empowers you to be, do, and have something that you choose to be, do, and have. Money's only value is when it leaves your hand. But we will create these artificial, as I said, these artificial economic constructions called interest rates and so forth to, to convince you to hoard your money. So save a little if you want to, it's all right. I don't save very much myself. I just kind of like keep it moving, keep it moving, you know? Just keep it, keep it going out there. I think we have to forget everything we've ever learned about money. Why do you think we have to erase the blackboard and wipe the slate completely clean? Even those of us who have been blessed to have a, a bit of money in their lives sometimes have a hard time dealing with that and being okay with it. Because virtually every message we've received about money makes money the bad guy, the villain, and by extension those who have it, the villains in life, even though most people are not villains, even those who have a great deal of money. And it's almost as if those who do have a little bit of it maybe got it some way that was undeserving, that it wasn't fair, or it's not okay for them to have it. So there's a huge myth about money. I call it the money myth. And the money myth in uh, human society is that it's really not okay which is interesting because everyone wants it. So that puts everyone in a position of wanting something that is very not okay to have. It's a little bit like sex, it's the same way. I don't know very many people who don't want as much sex, good sex at least, as they can get. But it's very not okay in most places in our society. And See, I'm not really joking about this, I'm being quite serious. It's very not okay in our society to want a lot of sex. If you come right out and say, I want a lot of sex, people think that they're, you're, they're somehow you're deranged or you're not okay in some way. It's, you know, money is the same way. Even more so. Even more so. You know, if you walk down the street and ask people about their sex lives, they'll actually talk to you about that. But ask them how much they have in their bank account. Watch their face go crazy. You want to know what? What I have in my bank account? I beg your pardon. That's very personal. Oh, who you slept with last night is not? Well, a little bit, but this is really personal. You're talking about money here. So people have even a more negative charge about money than they do even about, you know, their own sexuality. Interesting, isn't it? How, how to make friends with money? Imagine that money was a gift to you from the universe with which to do every good thing for yourself and for others that you ever wanted to do. Now we have yet another hurdle to get across. Oh my, if I have a lot of money, I can actually do good things for myself. I can actually go out and buy a, a, a very expensive Italian suit or $550 Italian shoes. Do I dare even say that I'm wearing $550 Italian shoes? Actually, I am. You know how long it took me to be okay with a pair of $550 Italian shoes? I mean, it's not about the shoe. It's about what this represents in my life. And it doesn't represent that I have the money to afford it. It represents that I have the mindset to make it okay for me to have this. There is no part 
of life whatsoever that is not a part of God. There's no aspect of the life energy whatsoever that is not holy and sacred. Nothing is evil, less thinking make it so. Let us stop making money evil. Let's stop making sex evil, and most of all, let's stop making each other evil. What are we doing here? And why are we doing it? Why do we insist on seeing evil and negativity in every corner of our lives? What is that about? If we see life as essentially good, we'll solve our problems with money and we'll make money our friend. And then we'll do good things with that money, good things for ourselves because we deserve it. I deserve these shoes and so do you. And then we'll do good things for others. We'll share of the abundance which is ours and the abundance which is given to us by God with all those whose lives we touch and no one will be without anything. There's enough for all of us. And when we choose that, we'll be friends with money, with ourselves, with everyone else, and with God. When you change the be, do, have paradigm, you start acting as if, and your body begins to understand at a cellular level who you think you really are. See, when I was a kid, my father used to say, who the hell do you think you are anyway? Spent the rest of my life trying to answer that question. So, and my body is trying to understand what I think about that. So as my body starts moving through the field of gross energy, it starts moving things around, begins to give things away, for instance, and your body starts getting the message, I have that which I would choose to receive. I already have it. Now once you cross that huge barrier, because you think you don't have it, and you're trying to get that which you do not have, namely more money. But once you get that you have it, then it just becomes a question of how many zeros are after the first number. You understand? And so you'll discover that what goes around indeed does come around. Not because you perform some real true magic trick in the universe, but because you finally got the truth of who you are at some universal cosmic level. And the universe never says no to your thought about yourself. It only grows it. Did you hear what I just said? I said, the universe never says no to your thought about yourself. It only grows it. I mean, the universe is really wonderful. You'll love God, because God grows on you. <laughs> See, God is like the manure of the universe. Oh. <laughs> I thought I would say something absolutely outrageous. <laughs> Just completely outrageous. Total juxtaposition to see whether your minds can hold, you know, the most outrageous thought. Because, and I meant that in the kindest way, <laughs> because God is that which makes things grow. Makes things grow. And it will make you grow. Whatever it is you think you would like to be, do, or have, cause another to be, do, or have that. See yourself as the source rather than the recipient of what it is you would choose to experience in life. For you are not in fact the recipient, but you have been and always will be the source. When you imagine yourself to be the source of that which you wish you could receive, you become very resourceful. And then you do become a magician. You do become a magician. You might even be called a sorcerer. What is your question? Go ahead. I, I hear that and I understand that and I get that. I want you, I wondered if you could address the issue that there is, re, is resistance with one in, within oneself that one encounters in doing that because there's still the belief, the slash fear that, well, if I give it away, then I won't have it. So it's the resistance that is the rub, so to speak, and, and I'm curious to know how you deal with that and, and et cetera, the well, resistance I, within. I just feel the resistance and ignore it, see, because now I know better. So because what I know is that what you resist persists, and what you look at disappears. 
So whenever I feel resistance to anything, I know that that is where truth lies, just beyond that resistance. Whenever resistance appears anywhere in my reality, I know that just beyond that is where the grandest truth resides. And because I know that, I welcome that feeling. You know, that, that feeling of discomfort? See, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So in the moment that I start feeling uncomfortable, I go, oh, there's that feeling of discomfort again. Yes, yes, bring it on. I'm actually comfortable with my discomfort, mm. if that can make any sense. Do you understand the, the, the divine dichotomy? I find comfort in my discomfort. That, uh, uh, I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure, means I'm absolutely sure. It means that the highest part of myself is speaking to me in a way that vibrates throughout every cell of my body that I used to call discomfort and that I now call a signal from the divine. Move into that, not away from it. Every time I have denied myself the experience of my own greatness, it's because I've moved away from rather than into my discomfort and locked myself out from my place of joy. Not once in a while. Not now and then. Every single time. Now, when I say that life begins at the end of your comfort zone, what I mean is that it, it is on the other side of your comfort that your challenge will be found, your greatest opportunity will be found. The tendency of all of us is to stay comfortable, not just physically comfortable, but in fact, more often, mentally comfortable. When we're mentally comfortable, we're mentally stagnant as well. We're just kind of like blobbing out there mentally and spiritually as well. And the excitement in life is at the edge of all of that. It's on the other side of where we are comfortable. The danger of being comfortable, of course, is that we don't grow. We, we learn nothing and we do not expand at all. So I always look to see what is making me uncomfortable and I move into that because it, it is what's making me uncomfortable that will ultimately make me larger and cause me to grow and become a bigger version of myself, a bigger version of who I am. Therefore, in my life, anything that makes me uncomfortable, I take a closer look at. The point I'm trying to make is that in my life, I've learned to look at whatever makes me uncomfortable and then to move into more of the experience of that because there's probably something there that I want to heal or at the very least take a close exploration of to see whether it's, here I go again, serving me to be discomforted by that. So when I say that life begins at the end of your comfort zone, I really mean that. On this side of our comfort zone is not real life, but kind of a slow death. I think people should be uncomfortable at least six times a day. And if you're not, do something that makes yourself uncomfortable. Give a speech, sing a song, dan dance a dance. Go to see a movie with lots of sexuality in it. Or lots of violence for that matter, if violence makes you uncomfortable. I'm now, I'm now going to movies that have lots of violence in them. I'm allowing myself to experience the discomfort and now I can speak out against that kind of violence in movies, that kind of gratuitous violence in movies and become a real avid spokesman about that, you see? so. I think people should do something six times a day to make themselves feel uncomfortable. I can tell you that eight times out of ten when I have moved into my discomfort, I have come out of the other side giggling, laughing, and filled with joy. That is more often than not uh, the experience once we move into it, once we become what I call comfortable with our discomfort. And by the way, all true leaders, all true change agents, all true masters are people who have become comfortable with their discomfort. Now there are those among you who might say, but what of caution? To which I say, throw caution to the wind. What can you lose but everything? 
And until you're willing to lose it all, you cannot have it all. Because you think it's about holding on to what it is you now have got. And that which you hold on to will slip through your fingers. Yet that which you let go will come back to you sevenfold. Because you're holding on to something dearly for dear life is the grandest announcement that you think that you are separate from everyone else. See, I'm over here and you're over there and I've got this stuff and I've got to hold on to it. But your letting go is the grandest announcement that you're clear that there's no place where you end and where I begin. Therefore, in a very real sense, when I let go of it to you, I give it back to myself. Therefore, these three words to always remember. Have these words tattooed on your left wrist. Be the source. Be the source of that which you would choose for another. Come from that place of, I am the source. If you want more magic in your life, bring more magic into the room with you. If you want more love in your life, bring more love into the room with you. Be the source in the lives of another of that which you would have in your own life. If you want more money in your life, bring more money into the life of another. Whatever it is you want more of, if you want more compassion in your life, if you want more wisdom in your life, be the source of wisdom in the life of another. And through this process and the process of beingness, the process of being who you really are, you will bring yourself the experience of right livelihood virtually overnight. And the world will shower upon you all the rewards for which you reached in vain for so many years. So allow your doingness to spring from your place of beingness. Be happy, be abundant, be wise, be creative, be understanding, be a leader, be who you really are in every moment of your life. Come from that place and let your doingness spring from that place. And you'll not only find right livelihood, you will have created for yourself a life rather than a living. Thank you. Mm -hmm.